The greatest spy to ever live was a man of impressive fact and almost unbelievable legend, with both verifiable feats of espionage and romanticized stories about his exploits. It's believed that he spied for nearly all of the world's great powers at some point during his life, including for the United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, and Russia. In his most daring missions, Sidney George Riley infiltrated enemy leadership, swapped identities at a whim, and led an attempt to overthrow the Bolshevik government and rescue the royal family. Sidney George Riley's life began when he was born Sigmund Rosenblum in Odessa on March 24th of 1874. Little about his early years are known, but it's believed that he studied chemistry in Austria and then traveled to Brazil, where he became friends with officers from the British Army. This relationship led him to the London office of the British Secret Intelligence Service. At least, that's one story. Contradictory accounts, with some evidence to support them, hold that Rosenblum actually went to Paris instead of Brazil, where he stole Italian revolutionary funds before traveling to Great Britain. Researcher Giles Milton has assessed these controversies, stating, quote, Rosenblum fled Odessa in his late teens for reasons that remain obscure. He would later spin tales about how he had been a cook, dock worker, a railway engineer in India, and a brothel doorman in Brazil, but there's no certainty that he did any of those jobs. There are many unverified stories of his early forays into espionage. It is factually known that by 1895 he was in London, and that in 1899 he had an affair with and later married Margaret Callahan Thomas, the widow of Reverend Hugh Thomas. After her first husband's death, she inherited around 800,000 pounds. Suspiciously, the Reverend's death was attributed to influenza, with a recommendation for no autopsy or further investigation. The attending doctor, Dr. T.W. Andrew, was described by those present as having similar physical features to Rosenblum. While it can't be confirmed if Sigmund Rosenblum was involved in the Reverend's death, no records from that time period support the existence of a doctor with the name T.W. Andrew in Britain. Thanks to the marriage in 1899, Rosenblum was able to adopt the name Sidney George Riley and a fake British passport, possibly procured by the British intelligence community to facilitate his future work for them. Rumors hold that Riley counted on an additional 10 passports with different identities. He caught the attention of officers at the British Secret Intelligence Service due to his charm, intelligence, ability to camouflage, and prowess for telling stories that merged fact with fiction as if they were part of his DNA. In addition, he was inexplicably well prepared to be a spy, as stated by Richard B. Space, author of Riley's biography. Quote, he demonstrated sufficient knowledge of chemistry to gain membership in the Chemical Society in 1896 and the Institute of Chemistry in 1897. He had an exceptional command of languages, including English, Russian, Polish, German, and French. Riley and his new wife traveled in June of 1899, just months after their wedding, to the Russian Empire in a mission for the British War Office. Soon after arriving, General Akashi Morojiro reached out to him to offer employment under the Japanese Secret Intelligence Services, reportedly impressed that Riley followed money rather than national alignment or ideology. The general succeeded in recruiting Riley to give Russian revolutionaries financial assistance in exchange for information of Russian intelligence and armed power. Simultaneously, while in Russia, he investigated the specific locations of the oil deposits in the Caucasus region for the United Kingdom. This marked the first time he worked as a double agent. Right before the Russo-Japanese War broke out, Riley traveled to Manchuria, where he stayed for four years, taking up ownership of a dubiously obtained timber company. Still working for both Japan and Great Britain, he used this time to gain personal influence over the espionage network in the region and to exploit the precarious condition of Port Arthur where he resold overpriced basic goods such as food, medicine, and coal, profiting from the war and amassing a small fortune. His missions from that time have been sometimes contested by investigators, but he allegedly played a key role in getting Australian owner of the Anglo-Persian oil company, William Darcy, to offer a partnership to Britain rather than France that would let them extract oil from southern Persia. He also reportedly obtained a rare German magneto ignition system from a plane that crashed at the first Frankfurt International Air Show in 1909, but no news reports exist of such a plane crashing. 
His endeavors in Imperial Germany were better documented, where he moved to Essen under the name Karl Hahn. He obtained a minor position welding at Krupp Funworks, where he worked up to join the fire brigade. Once he was in it, he convinced the foreman to give him schematics of the plant so he and the rest of the fire crew knew the exact position of hydrants and extinguishers. Using the excuse of visiting the foreman's office to use the schematics, Karl Hahn located the archive holding secret plans. At the crack of dawn one morning, he broke into the office and stole the plans, which he then mailed in four separate pieces to Britain. By that evening, he was residing at a safe house in Dortmund, and only a few months later, in April of 1912, he'd be at St. Petersburg, living as a prominent businessman and patron of the Wings Aviation Club. World War I broke out in 1914, and the talented spy's skills were put fully to use. He spent the first few years in New York, working for British intelligence to sabotage German connections with the U.S. and to instigate enmity towards the Central Powers. Never one to stick with one side, Riley sold ammo and allegedly information to Imperial Germany until the U.S. got involved in the war in 1917, and he was no longer allowed to sell them ammunition. That same year, his other client, the Imperial Russian Army, stopped buying ammo as the country began its internal revolution. He decided to focus on his spy work, and upon return to London, was commissioned as a second lieutenant and case officer in His Majesty's Secret Intelligence Service. Riley was next sent to Murmansk before April 5th of 1918 to counter Bolshevik activities in Russia. Former Okhrana agent Alexander Gramatikov, who viewed the Soviets as crazed agitators, gave him refuge at his own niece's apartment and helped him get in contact with generals and the secretary of the Council of People's Commissars so he could pretend to be a Bolshevik sympathizer. With help from a former Okhrana agent, who was by then a Cheka official, he obtained permits to travel as an agent of the Cheka, the first and highly feared Soviet secret police. With co-conspirators Boris Savinkov and Robert Bruce Lockhart, Riley began hatching plans to rescue the Romanovs and end the Bolshevik hold on power. His attempt to assassinate Lenin and Trotsky stands as one of his most daring and failed missions. Lockhart had been tasked with liaising with Soviets to undermine Soviet-German talks and get the Soviets to reopen a front against Germany. But by the time Riley had landed in Russia, Lockhart was failing. He moved his efforts towards instigating an Allied military intervention in the turmoiled country, and he had Sidney Riley reach out to anti-Bolshevik groups to spread the word of an upcoming fight. In May, both of them met with Boris Savinkov, who was the leader of the Anti-Revolutionary Union for the Defense of the Motherland and Freedom. Savinkov was a crucial ally, previously war minister for the provisional government, and also previously a member of the Socialist Revolutionary Party. He was fully invested in taking down the Soviets and had formed an army of a few thousand already. The three of them began scheming and contacting secret anti-Bolshevik groups within the Socialist Revolutionary Party. Riley began recruiting Latvians from the Rifle Division, led by Colonel Eduardo Berzin. As the Latvians served as the elite Bolshevik force in charge of defending both the Kremlin and Lenin himself, infiltrating them would be vital to launching a successful coup on the newly forming Soviet state. What the three conspirators hoped was to have Lenin and Trotsky assassinated before the end of the year. The group, with input from anti-Bolsheviks and foreign allied powers, designed a plan for the coup and the military leaders who would take over once they succeeded. What they did not count on was Colonel Eduardo Berzin's loyal soldier mentality. Berzin informed Felix Edmundovich Drzinski, popularly known as Iron Felix through the Cheka, about the attempts by the foreign agents to recruit him for their takeover. Iron Felix already had some of this information, as the Cheka had been spying on the British as well. In turn, the revolutionary Bolshevik leader had Berzin and other officials play along with the infiltrators so he could gather intelligence on their plans. An Allied strike force under the name Operation Archangel landed at Arkhangelsk on August 4th, 1918, allegedly to stop the Imperial German Army from accessing and stealing military supplies kept in the area. In response, the Soviets attacked the British Embassy on August 5th, just as a meeting between Latvians, UDMF members, Lockhart and Riley was taking place. Undisturbed by the raid and the ones that followed, Riley tread on with the planning. The coup was planned to take place at the Bolshoi Theater during a Council of People's Commissars meeting. In preparation, 
Riley spent around a million rubles bribing Red Army soldiers so they would arrest the Soviet leaders. This would be paired with the disruption of the food supply around the country as a way to incite civil unrest. Once Lenin and Trotsky were gone, the plan was to install a puppet government that could continue rallying against the German Reich of Kaiser Wilhelm II. The mission, dubbed the Ambassador's Plot, began to fall apart when Moisei Uritsky, the leader of the Cheka at Petrograd, was assassinated on orders from Boris Savinkov and another conspirator. This was taken as a great offense to the Cheka and the Bolshevik movement. That same day, there was an assassination attempt on Lenin as he left the Mikkelsen Arms Factory in Moscow. He was shot at by Fania Kaplan, a member of the Socialist Revolutionary Party. One of the shots entered Lenin's lung while another entered his neck, centimeters away from his jugular. The Soviet leader was expected to pass away within hours, if not minutes. As the press reported on the matter, pro-Leninist sentiment grew. The scheduled meeting between Trotsky and Lenin for which the Red Army soldiers had been compensated to arrest them was cancelled. Members of the dissenter and foreign influencer groups were bothered that someone had taken a shot too early. Yet it's unclear whether Fania Kaplan was involved in the ambassador's plot. Regardless, these two events changed public sentiment and brought a newfound anger and determination to the Bolsheviks. The events were used by Felix Edmundovich Drzinski to set the Cheka against foreigners and dissenters, implicating them in a grand conspiracy not too far removed from the intended plan. He launched the era of repression and horror that came to be known as the Red Terror. Riley's most important and daring mission was all but dead. As the Cheka raided foreign embassies and key reunion points, Lockhart was arrested. Members of their group lost their lives. Riley was forced to run as the Russian public hunted him, in the way a village may hunt a wolf that's eaten all the livestock. After the newspapers Pravda and Izvestia credited him with the aborted coup attempt in the front pages of their September 2nd, 1918 publications. Riley's own adulterous romantic partners were arrested and his safe house was raided. Using his contacts and a Baltic German passport, he escaped from Kronstadt, located on the Russian island of Kotlin, towards Helsinki on a ship. With the help of smugglers, he was then transported to Stockholm. By November 8th, Riley had safely set foot back in London. Savinkov had escaped as well, and Lockhart was deported to Great Britain as part of an exchange from Maxim Litvinov, an important pro-Bolshevik activist who would later become a significant Soviet politician. Lockhart would one day recall his adventures and misadventures with Riley, describing him as, quote, a man of great energy and personal charm, very attractive to women and very ambitious. I had not a very high opinion of his intelligence, his knowledge covered many subjects from politics to art, but it was superficial. On the other hand, his courage and indifference to danger were superb. In 1922, during a visit to Berlin, Riley met Pepita Bovedilla, a young, beautiful actress who pretended to be South American, but was really Nellie Burton the widow of dramatist Charles Hatton Chambers. The two masters of identity creation fell in love and married on May 18, 1923 in London, despite the fact that Riley was already married. While Bobadilla would later describe her husband as a bit of a lonely hermit, she was very much in love with him. They had only 30 months together before Riley headed back to Russia. As Bobadilla would later recount, he wanted to go back to assist his friends and quote, this he did in 1925, and never came back. It's widely accepted that the Joint State Political Directorate, the new Soviet secret police, arrested the spy. While it's contested whether he was executed or somehow turned a dire situation in his favor, he was never seen again. In the years to come, the life and legend of the greatest spy ever to live, Sidney Riley, would come to feature in news publications, books, and movies, eventually inspiring the creation of the most famous fictional spy, James Bond. <laughs> 